Okay, we are live, I'm being told. So tonight's guest speaker is Paxton Hoag. Um, I know Paxton from the Oregon Country Fair. He's one of the originators of the, that event. He's been around for the whole well, 52 years. He's been off and on the board of directors of that event for a, something like that. Ridiculous. Um, <laughs> he's... Uh, He's a native Oregonian. He grew up around the Astoria region, the wettest place in the state, which led to his interest in mushrooms, which was uh, encouraged by his parents. And um, he early on got interested in medicinal mushrooms, including psilocybins. And um, he's going to tell us about the story of finding a brand new species of psilocybe new to science that he discovered. Welcome, Paxton Hope. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah, I uh, actually, I'm not a native Oregonian. I was born in Waltham, Massachusetts, but my father was in the Navy and got transferred to Astoria in 1954 and when I was in the third grade. So I, when we had our 200th anniversary of Astoria, I realized that I had actually lived in Astoria for a quarter of its history. So I consider myself an Astorian. Uh, the, in this picture, the little batch of azurescence there is from one of the original sites that we collected these things in 1977 and in the early 80s. Uh, it's still fruiting today. This picture was taken a couple of years ago during, during COVID. Uh, the, this is what Shroomery says about the discovery of azurescence. Uh, the known history of Azure is pretty limited. Uh, supposedly, a group of Boy Scouts were camping close to the Columbia River Delta in Oregon, discovered the shroom in 1979. It's reported that some of the Boy Scouts consumed the mushrooms and experienced their potent psychedelic effects. However, there's little information, if any, there was to back this story up. Well, it's totally untrue. <laughs> Uh, as part of the actual uh, 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 monograph that Paul Stamets published in 1996 on the uh, uh, on naming psilocybe azurescence, uh, it 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 mentions that I'm and Mark Herc are the first people credited to collect the mushroom. Uh, I want to confess that's not true. I was brought the mushroom by another person in Astoria uh, uh, called Dickie Bird, who was a, a contemporary younger, slightly younger than me, but was a local kid who had mental challenge problems. Uh, but he was, as some of these people are very, very smart. And he found this a strange mushroom on the waterfront of Astoria and brought it to me. And I took one look at it and said, it's not in any of the books. I'd been picking Liberty Caps for quite a while and had been going to, I went to the 1976 and first international conference on psychedelic mushrooms. Uh, and so I, I had some experience with it. And so uh, uh, he taught me, showed me where places it grew up and basically, it grew along the waterfront of Astoria in the remnants of an old housing project done by the railroad uh, that had a lot of untreated wood that was decaying. And the, they really like untreated wood. There's also scotch broom in the area and, that's, and blackberries. And those are two very common components in, a, in an area where azure essence fruit. <laughs> Uh, I have no idea where the mushroom originally came from. Uh, it's on built up lands. Almost all the azure essence on the coast is on lands that man has changed. Uh, it's, uh, uh, anyway, almost all of it. I, so I think there's a correlation between people and uh, psilocybin mushrooms. I really do. Uh, I think they fruit where people are. Um, And there's a classic batch of azurescence. 
that is actually growing growing in a garden. Um, Dickie Bird brought me this mushroom. Uh, uh, and so I started going, I went back to the next, this is actually the first uh, uh, international conference on psilocybin mushrooms. Um, it's, I'm trying to... Anyway, Paul is the second from the left, uh, Stamets. And that's where I first met Paul. And I actually guessed on Guzman, who at that time was the world expert in psilocybin and mushrooms. Uh, the, one of the highlights of these meetings is, this was at Miller Sylvania State Park in 1976. Uh, I think it cost $35 to go to the conference. Uh, 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 David Rathby and Dale Leslie. Uh, on the far uh, left there is uh, Wasson. Uh, who made the trip to Mexico and discovered uh, Psilocybe Mexicana. It was fun to meet him. Uh, I also then jumped to the next conference, uh, uh, took the a single pin that we had. These conferences, Azure Essence is fruiting earlier than it used to. It was always at the tail end of October, and I would be lucky. I couldn't get a full specimen. I only had pins, often with their veils still closed. So it made it really hard to identify and tell you that it's, you know, something else, uh, you know, what it is. And so uh, Gaston Guzman on Friday of this conference held a laboratory workshop. Now, oh, good, this is a great place to take it. And so I took it there, and again, everybody agreed. It's not in any of the books. Uh, uh, and so he encouraged me at that time to, uh, uh, do a type collection for him. Uh, 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 another, again, one of the nice things about going to mushroom conferences, so you meet luminaries, that's Albert Hoffman, the inventor of LSD, who was also at that conference. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, again, I took it to the next conference was Mushrooms One in 1979 by that time we had a good handle on where and when it was coming up but again this, this i had pins actually i think i mean no did i not i'm missing one picture and that's of me with kit skates holding uh, the very one, two pins I had at that time. This is the faculty at the Mushrooms one. Jeff Chelton, Paul Stamets, Jim Jacobs, Gaston Guzman, Gary Menser, and Kit Skates. And this is actually where uh, uh, Guzman encouraged me to send him a type collection. Now, type collection is kind of where you throw a circle on the ground, collect all the mushrooms in it, describe them, you know, what their stem, the stipe is, the cap is, the descriptions, the lengths, you measure all the lengths, you measure all of them. And then I dried them and sent them off to Gaston Guzman. Uh, and that was about 1980, 80, 81. This is a conference, uh, the final conference at the uh, Mushrooms One, uh, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, uh, I guess I don't. Yeah, Jeff Chilton uh, on the left. Uh, oh, no, that's a different. I got my name is mixed up. I'm sorry. Anyway, anyway, I'm going to continue on. Uh, let's see if I can go backwards. Oh, goody. I didn't want to do that. I hit some button that I shouldn't have, I'm sure. Click on OK, and then click on the picture, and it should bring it back up. The, the, yeah. I think I got it. Never oh, okay. Yeah. Well, and anyway, I wanted to get into the uh, type collection. Uh, 
uh, against. Wait, sure. Online. I don't see Zoom in your buttons are I'm where I'm going to start next yeah yes okay anyway uh, as I was telling a type collection is where you throw you know, um, I'll uh, circle down and measure all the mushrooms. I sent the first one off in 1980 to Gaston Guzman in Mexico City. And he came back several months later and misidentified it as Psilocybe colosa. Now, all of us that had been involved in the mushroom conferences that knew that was a wrong uh, identification, but colosa is a dung inhabitor. And the azure essences are this is a wood inhabitor. And by the way, we were at this time calling it Astoriae or Astoriensis because there was no name. Uh, and that was one of my things about taking it to these conferences. How do I get a name for this? You know, what, what are we picking? And, and so this is in 1983, I went out to King Road uh, in Warrington, another site that fruits well with azure essence. And uh, on the east bank of the Skippinon River, uh, it's Port of Astoria property, and it's just kind of unattended. I told the port that they had an incredible genetics bank out there when they were doing their long-range plan, and they did not want to hear that, <laughs> what it was. Anyway, and it is an incredible genetics bank. Uh, so I went out there and collected a second type uh, 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 kit and sent it off to Guzman. And, and he identified it as Liniformis, uh, Psilocybe Liniformis, which we also knew was not correct. At that point, I took it to Paul Stamets and said, please do this, you know, uh, uh, and, and take it through. And he, with Johann Gartz in Germany, did the chemistry. Paul did the micro macro analysis work. Oops. That's okay. I don't mind going forward and backward. Right. Any anyway, um, yeah. The uh, 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 and so, as I said, I took it to Paul. Uh, Alan Rockefeller, when he was down in Mexico City a couple of years ago got the chance to go through Gaston Guzman's archives. And this is uh, the, his report from my type collection that I sent him in 1983, where he misidentified it as Psilocybe liniformis, which it says right down there. <laughs> my notes, Habitat A, growing on a rotten log of grass with sand underneath. Uh, Alan was able to take spore photographs, macro photo, uh, microscopic photographs of the spores from that collection. 
and I, I wouldn't be surprised if he kept some. This is actually where the collection came from. Uh, on the side of uh, uh, on uh, the Skippinon River. This is also another interesting couple of pictures from that time period. Uh, this is early on. This is a very small set of mushrooms. The three to the uh, uh, left are, I left behind, I picked the big one. Uh, which was probably only two, two and a half inches across at that time. Uh, this is 30 days later. They had matured, covered in sand from storms, but uh, uh, they survived 30 days out there in that environment. Uh, and right now, there's late fruiting of azurescence out on the coast still happening. It's kind of really amazing. This, uh, in the early uh, 80s, uh, well, Mushroom One was the first one in 1979. And then in, in 80, I was going to go to the second mushroom conference in Orcas Island, uh, the Mushrooms Two. And uh, 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 had another encounter with Dickie Bird, which I'll bring up a little bit later in the end of the meeting. Uh, he's a major character in this story in reality, but mainly because of his ability to discover and find. And in reality, he developed uh, technology to transfer the, the spawn from uh, live location to live location. He started several different patches in Astoria. Uh, quite an amazing person. But in 1980, it, uh, uh, he stopped me from going to the Mushroom Conference. As I say, I'll get to that a little. Uh, this is probably from uh, 85, one of the Mushroom Conferences in 85. That's Paul Stamets at one of our lab work sessions. And that's Azurus on his shoulder. And that's who the mushroom is named after. <laughs> and if you notice, he's paying close attention. Though he has become a commercial fisherman in Alaska, at, last, at least last I saw him, and is not involved in mushrooms at all. <laughs> uh, Gary Linkoff and one of our mushroom tasting sessions at the, these conferences were held at Brighton Bush uh, and was just a wonderful place to do a conference. The mushrooms fruit all over the place. And so they're great places to go for a just outside your door. You know, uh, uh, and at this time, Lois and I were picking heavily in Astoria, and we were picking a uh, uh, men on horseback, Tricholoma flavovirens in the early 80s. Uh, a really, really one of my favorite tasty mushrooms, which is now recommended that you don't eat. Uh, uh, I still eat them, but I would not recommend that you eat them because of other people's recommendations. But we took cartons of those to the mushroom conference and won the tasting session twice. The first time we took them, we let somebody else cook them and they mixed wine and other stuff into it. And, and we didn't feel they were good. So the next two times, Lois and I just did it ourselves. And the, uh, as, uh, uh, like beach mushrooms, they're sandy. And so we're sitting there in the sink washing them. This is a group of mushroom people who, ah, you're washing mushrooms. <laughs> you know, and they are so sandy. That's what Andy Weil said. They're so sandy. You just have to do it. You know, otherwise you're just crunching on it. And and they hold up well, very well. They're a very meaty mushroom. Uh, and then as they say, we won the tasting session twice at some of these conferences. Uh, it's fun to, again, break all the rules taste half a dozen different kinds <laughs> at once. Uh, it's always been my goal going to one of these type of conferences to try and learn one new edible mushroom, each one, you know, because you've got experts there to talk about and you sit down and really talk about how to, how do you define this? How do you, you know, what are the characteristics that you really need to pay attention to and look for? Uh, I love that. Andy Weil, uh, was a big person uh, in, in these conferences and really, really helped us. Uh, 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 well, he's helped 
psilocybin mushrooms in the research of that tremendously over the years. Here he's identifying mushrooms from our forays. Here's another batch, a couple of ones. These are growing out of the waterfront down close to Astoria and in town. Most of the stuff in town, uh, uh, as they say, was really between the waterfront and the railroad tracks. In this old housing development uh, that housed railroad employees in the 30s and 40s, and by the 60s, it was they were mostly gone. But there was a lot of wood debris left. And then there was scotch broom. And we originally found the mushroom kind of crawling around in the scotch broom. You know, uh, it really likes the microclimate and the root structure of the scotch broom. And if you're out at the coast, uh, uh, at the beach, and you want to find them, look at the scotch broom and the microclimate at the root structure. It's a great place to find them. They come up in grass. Uh, in any number of ways. So you never know where you're actually going to find them. No, no, no. Uh, the habitat goes all the way up from Vancouver that we know of in the wild from Vancouver Island to uh, 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 Northern California, actually even the Bay Area. Uh, again, it's environmental conditions. They like a lot of water. They have very need a high moisture content. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think they live close to the, the shore. We tried planting a bed at Brighton Bush at one time, and that did not survive. Uh, uh, we got into quite a bit of planting different uh, gardens around, you know. Okay, we started this off by actually, we were lucky. Mark Hurton, my friend, I mentioned earlier, had a contact with a, a, a big wood chipper. I mean, that literally chip wood pile 80 feet tall, you know, and ship it out on barges. And so he'd get noticed when they were chipping alder. And we'd go out there and get a pick, take a pickup truck go and get a, a scoop load in the pickup truck for 20 bucks. Then we'd go around all the patches we'd found and then load them, cover them with a snow shovel, you know, out of the bat of the truck. And then we, the next year coming up in the mid 80 mushroom conferences we'd go out there and dig up that spawn and take it to the conference and we gave large chunks of spawn away to anybody who wanted to grow it uh we know of pro uh people in austria Ger uh, and europe that grew it that took spawn back with them and grew it same thing with new zealand and in australia uh spawn got that far down there for people to experiment a lot of people in Portland, uh, the Willamette Valley. So there's wild patches running around the Willamette Valley that people originally started, you know, and they they get into. So they aren't limited to the coastal environment, but the real criteria is moisture. They dry out quickly, and uh, 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 once they dry out, they don't seem to survive very well. <laughs> and, of course, a hard freeze We'll do them in something in the low twenties. Uh, one of the nicest things I found is that they survive frost very well and continue to grow. They thought they will be harder, hard, and yet they will uh, uh, thaw out and continue to grow. I think they have some sort of natural antifreeze in them, and I don't think anybody's done any research on that. Uh, there. One of the things about the field of mycology is there's so many places to look at for things to do research and new things to find and stuff like that. It really is unstudied. There's, there's, it's a you know huge area. This was the final uh, 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 mycomedia conference uh, up at Brighton Bush uh, in 1999 the Millennia Michael Media Conference, Paul tried to invite every one of this faculty that he had at previous conferences there to come. And I know he lost his shirt financially on it, but we had a great time. Uh, uh, Alexander Shugan and the tall blonde, uh, Andy Weil, quite a number of the world experts really showed up at this one. It just, it was uh, an amazing uh, conference. The buses from uh, uh, Kevin Kesey's uh, further two, and he showed up for the conference too.
there's now I'm not in that picture because I'm taking one beside the guy taking this one. <laughs> Okay, I mentioned that we started doing gardening. Uh, and this is from some of the early stuff. If you look at what Mark had a, was a farmer, came from, I think, South Dakota, and really had an intuitive understanding of composting and stuff like this. It was a real gardener. He crossed over to uh, Azurescence and did some amazing stuff. When he started generating his spawn, he would take a standard, you know, little pot greenhouse tray and put sawdust down on the bottom, alder sawdust down on the bottom uh, that we mine from an alder mill in Seaside. We'd go down with a shovel and load up bags and take it home. And anyway, he'd sprinkle spawn on a uh, 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 chip. And then he would use also alder chip that was cut lengthwise so it becomes curly cues. And that keeps high aeration in that. Gives, you know, it, it keeps the density not so hard. Anyway, and then he'd also put in a, a regular small chip and, and then sticks like this. You know, he'd split alder and make these little sticks and put them in the tray and then more sawdust on it, more small chip, you know. And then he'd just put another one on top, do the same thing, in the ba and then throw them all in the basement under his workbench. Uh, uh, cool, gro good growing conditions. And by uh, spring, they were rock solid batches of spawn. And he'd take them out and put them out, and, you know, around his house and in flower beds kind of thing, under, under shade cover. And... Uh, 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 this is what happened. <laughs> they, they fruited prolifically. The longer sticks turned out really help fruiting for multiple years. You know, you need to continue to chip a bed like this if you're going to do something, but because uh, uh, it will eat up the food and go away. Paul has a path on his property that uh, uh, 800 feet long or something like that. That, that runs from the shoreline to, up to the house that he's got azurescence growing in and all he does is just throw chips on it on a periodic basis. It grows about 40 feet a year. I mean, it goes around in a circle. So it's an interesting pleasure. Wants to, if you feed it well, it grows prolifically. Uh, this is one of our beds out in the backyard. Uh, we, when we went into big time, uh, and I say big time because we just overdid ourselves, uh, we would create these beds that were probably 12 feet long by uh, four feet wide uh, and about six inches of chip depth. In retrospect, that was too much. Two inches of chip depth would be probably adequate to really start a good patch. Many of them didn't grow very well. You know, uh, we didn't end up with much contamination, but we just didn't get uh, as dense a growth as we expected. It could be. There's grass growing up through it, and we really encourage grass. And I think on a personal level, um, and you know, grasses are very high in DMTs, dimethyltryptamines. You, you can get off on just eating grass if you use a monooxidized inhibitor. Uh, and it's not something I'm into, so I'm not sure of the actual technology. An MAO inhibitor, and that will, you can get high on just regular grass outside. Uh, but that, I think, is part of the building blocks that the mushrooms use of, to, to develop the complex psilocybins, because those are... Uh, uh, kind of end all chains that you could that they break up and and utilize uh, nobody's done any research on that either that i know of uh, but anyway this is uh some of our beds did real well there was one bed in here that blew my mind because we were only collecting azure essence and all of our spawn stuff had been growing azure essence 
why did we come up with a patch of cyanescence in the middle of an azure essence bed? I had no clue until recently. Now we're finding that the coast is full of cyanescence equally as much as azure essence. And so when we were collecting, Mark was one of the first people to collect at Fort Stevens. And, and that's where this patch came from. And so he must have collected an azure essence, I mean, a, some cyan in there, along spawn along in there, along with the azure essence. And I think it kind of grows separately. They don't seem to grow together very well. So it formed its own little clump of cy prolific cyan essence. It, uh, it, it befuddled me for 20 some or more years why that happened. Anyway, there's more of the stuff outside his house. And classic azure essence, that I think is out in Hammond, near the Mooring Basin. I want to go back to one thing and talk about Dickie Bird a little bit. Uh, as I said, he was essential in this. He brought the mushrooms to the world in reality. And I really wanted to give him credit. I wanted to name, uh, I really wanted to name it Psilocybe bird eye. But in October uh, 1980, uh, right before the uh, uh, Orcas, I was getting ready to go to the Orcas Mushroom Conference. I looked up for, I was had all the doors in my, windows in my house open because it gets warm. October is one of the nicest months in Astoria. And I'm sitting there behind my desk and I look up and there is Dickie Bird with a 45 holding it straight at my head and saying, you sold a laser sculpting tool to two ladies, he named them, who are going to use it to do a lobotomy on me. What do you say to that? Uh, I basically said, Dickie Bird, you know me. It, it's not true. I didn't, wouldn't do anything like that. And he decided I was lying and open fire. Luckily, the first shot went over my head, uh, went through the wall of my house into the house across the street. He was using solid copper jacketed 45 bullets. Uh, then he decided he'd better aim for the body because it was a bigger target. <laughs> As I'm pushing my chair away and crawling under my desk, and he shot me twice at that time, uh, once through the arm, once through my side. Uh, and uh, uh, um, and so at that, by that time, I was under the desk. <laughs> and after about 20 seconds or 30 seconds, I stuck my head out. And yeah, he was gone. And uh, so I crawled out the desk, called 911. Uh, and 911 didn't, you know, that was Portland, not Astoria. And so when I told the operator I need an ambulance and gave him my address, uh, uh, actually, I dialed, oh, I didn't dial 911. That was the mistake. Uh, and and uh, so she called the, uh, put it through to the ambulance people and got me. I, I got out from under the desk, pulled up my shirt and said, yep, he did shoot me. I was in shock. None of the bullets hit bone or anything. So they went straight through me and through everything else. Uh, and and uh, uh, so I went out and met the ambulance outside on the sidewalk. To, uh, but at that point, I kind of figured out that he didn't deserve to have mushroom named after. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. He, I do want to credit him with, you, you hear people putting stem butts as azure essence and cyan essence in cardboard. He started that in reality by taking the azure essence beds he found, bearing the soil to where the spawn was on to the surface, putting cardboard down and wetting it and getting it to transfer into the cardboard, and then taking that and starting new patches along the waterfront of Astoria. The pictures that I showed, the, the first mushrooms I showed you, it's one of those patches. Uh, so, you know, a smart person, but again, mentally challenged. Uh, I, I, I have problems on trying to figure out what to call him in that sense. Uh, Dickie Bird's Dickie Bird. I grew up with him. 
I was taught to be nice to handicapped people, and I was always nice to him. He ended up pleading guilty to attempted murder, uh, got 20 years. Uh, he had health problems uh, uh, and uh, kidney and things like that problems. And they he served three years. They turned him loose with six months probation. At that point, I left Astoria and became a computer geek. I, I switched from fungi to uh, uh, a secondary market computer dealer and, and did that through the 90s and only went back and moved back to Astoria in 2000. Um, the, one of the interesting things, though, is I know where he got that delusion from. That it's so rare that you find something like that. One time he was over in the late seventies with Dale Hogue, another friend, and we were talking about what the future of technology. I'm a technologist, so I'm I'm enthusiastic about technology, and we were talking about what the future of technology and lasers would become. And I was talking about how in the long run lasers will be used for, you know carving stone and etching wood and we'll have use in medical instrumentations and stuff like this and 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 that's where that conversation is where dickie bird's delusion actually came from i'm certain it is uh uh kind of that's the rest of the story <laughs> as paul harvey would say um but anyway i'm pretty much done with what I there's another batch of from Hammond, I think, again. The whole waterfront along there is prolific. And this year has been a prolific year from the stuff I've been watching on Facebook. I've never, I didn't get out at all this year, uh, partly because my I'm having knee problems and so I'm really limited in my mobility. And I had to move from Astoria. I can't afford to live there anymore. So I'm now a resident of Eugene. Which gives me the opportunity to do this. The, no, the state of Oregon did not choose this. The state, and I think they will in the future, uh, because it's it is very useful in therapy, but it's also stronger than most. So there's, you know, regulating it's kind of difficult. Uh, state of Oregon has decided to only use psilocybin cubensis. For one, that is easily able to be grown in tubs, indoor, in a lab situation nowadays. And it's easily able to then analyze dosage and stuff like that. These are highly variable in reality. Uh, uh, this is, I found a, a, a patch we had started in Astoria uh, uh, many, many years ago out, on, out by Tongue Point, on the road to Tongue Point. And they had come through and bulldozed the area uh, uh, to build housing. And later on, a friend of mine was walking down there and found these growing down below. And it's from that original same shovel full of chips that we threw on it. And I mean, we threw many shovelfuls on that batch. They migrated down the slope and into an area. And, and, and uh, uh, this is what a really fully mature azure essence looks like. Uh, the root ball is full of little chips, that kind of stuff. And, and so, it, you know, what we talk about now and picking them is taking that little root ball off, putting it in some uh, soaked wood chips that you get from like Bimark, and it'll grow. And that generate that and cardboard, put it in cardboard first, you know, give a little bit more substrate. The black spots on them are from rain, bruising. Or freezing, you know. Freezing will turn to more purple. This is more likely rain. Uh, this is across from across the river at, uh, uh, oh, those actually are not uh, Azure Essence. Excuse me. And this is more from our garden. January 11th. They're still up. <laughs> Were. This is, again, 20 years ago, but uh, they were frozen solid at this point. I took them home and dried them out. You know, it's freeze-drying works well. 
And there's kind of where my end of this talk is. This is the family when we're out hunting out in Fort Stevens. These are all men on horseback or uh, Belita sedulous. That's, that's one, my favorite mushroom right there. Uh, and again, out of Fort Stevens. And I think that's my last slide.